So good to see you. Whenever this is, uh, this morning, tomorrow, I'm confused. I'm not sure when this is, but <laughs> it is so glad that we're so glad to see you tonight. What a great time of worship. And I just watch y'all need one more smart aleck up here. So <laughs> it is so good to see you tonight. Good to see Matt Weaver, the pastor at Southside. And uh, I just tell you, I'm not real smart, so I have to be a, an astute observer. But there's a pattern I've been seeing for years. When God brings, I mean, you've always had good pastors in this town, but, I mean, four of the sharpest guys that we have in the state, with Paul and Matt and Alan Elkins at Dollar Way and Todd at Watson Chapel, when God brings guys like this into a town, it's real unusual to have four new guys like that, and that just means God's getting ready to do some big stuff. So uh, that's always what I see. So it's exciting to see what's happening here. Uh, throughout, and uh, especially here for you guys. Filled overflow. That's exactly right. You're filled, but not just to hold it in, not just to do nothing with it. You're here to do something. And I am so convinced that that's why a lot of believers feel so flat, so empty, so bored, because we think if we just take in and just go deeper, that's all required. I read a book years ago, somebody called that Consecration Theology, which says if we just recommit and go deeper, that's all that's ever asked of us to do. And, and honestly, I grew up under a lot of that kind of thinking, that the epitome, the apex, the pinnacle is just recommit, and that's as far as you go, just recommit your heart. And I did that several times. I need to do it probably a whole lot more than I did. But I remember thinking there's still something missing. So in the same book, this guy said there's a next step called gift theology where you employ the gifts the Holy Spirit gave you at the moment of salvation in ministry. And I will tell you, whatever terminology you use, I really don't care. But you were filled to overflow. You were saved to do something. And you will never be utilized. You'll never be challenged unless you find what it is that God wants you to do. So that's kind of the theme of this morning, tonight, tomorrow night. It's where you fit in in certain roles. Tonight we're going to talk about where you fit in in evangelism or in outreach of those that are not in the kingdom. Now probably some of you are thinking, yeah, I know you used to be on the evangelism team up there and you're going to hack on us tonight about sharing our faith and we ought to do that. Well, I'm actually not going to. I mean, I could. We ought to be sharing our faith and we need to know how to share our faith. I'm, we make the folks that work at the Baptist building, all 75 full-time employees, Go through personal evangelism training once a year. I teach it all the time, and I still have to sit under it myself once a year. I feel a little bit remedial, but it's just good for me, to be honest. And so I do think that's a part of it. But we're going to talk about the broader picture tonight, you being involved in evangelism. And tonight we're going to give a little extra focus to the hard cases. I don't know if you have any hard cases down here in Whitehall. Do you even know any bad sinners? I want you to think about the two baddest sinners you can think of. Get them in your mind. Some of you looking around. I don't mean in here. I mean outside the church. (laughs) So the two folks on your mind, I want to give you some ideas, some principles of how to see those folks saved and how you can be a part of it. So that's kind of where we're going tonight with the tough cases. And I'll just tell you, the 16 years that I pastored, God put me in pretty difficult places. And uh, I remember thinking, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm telling the truth. I'm not just trying to sound good preaching. For 13 of 16 years, the first three churches I pastored, when I looked at my prospect list, this is what my prospect list looked like. Here's a name, and I'd say something about the name. Here's a name, he gets drunk every Friday night at the deer camp. Here's a name, he gets drunk every Friday night and Saturday night at the deer camp. Here's a name, he gets drunk every Sunday on the golf course. Here's a name, he gets drunk every Friday night and Saturday night at the deer camp and Sunday at the golf course. Here's a name that they said they'll never go back to church. Here's a name that says they don't believe in the Baptist church. Here's a name that says that they're living together. Another name living together, another name living together, another name living together, another name living together. Another name says they're mean, be careful. And on and on and on. That was my prospect list for 13 out of 16 years. I got two choices. Choice number one, 
It's sending my resume to the good places, or the places that all the good Baptists are moving to, Benton, Bryant, Cabot, Springdale, and I did. I really did. And nobody called, so I had to go to Plan B, which is reach the folks where I was. So, uh, so that's what we did. Sometimes these folks were bank presidents. Sometimes these folks were uh, ma- agency managers of insurance companies. Sometimes these folks own a string of businesses. Sometimes they were like your alcoholic uncle that lives at the end of a one-lane gravel road in a house trailer with cars and refrigerators in the yard. I went after all of them intentionally. I didn't let it rest. I made appointments. I went to see it all. And so, uh, honestly, what happened 13 to 16 years with those tough places and not good Baptists moving in, all good Baptists were moving out. Let me tell you what happened. We knocked the top out. We reached lots of folks. And uh, first church I pastored, I was a student at Washita, and it was real tough two years, I have to tell you. Now, I find out why they'd been through a preacher a year for about 12 to 15 years. It became real evident. And I remember thinking one day, God, I know you don't hate me because your love never fails, it never runs out, it never goes out. I remember thinking, i got to sing that song again. Year 12, I remember a quiet time. I just thought this. I said, Lord, you know, I'll go wherever you call me. I wonder if you're ever going to let me pastor one of them easy churches. <laughs> Last church was an easy church. We had a lot of Baptists moving in. Now, we reached a lot of radical pagans, too. We reached some most unbelievable, unchurched, non-believers you could imagine. I've been to work for the Arkansas Baptist State Convention one year. And I'd been to lots and lots and lots and lots of churches, helping churches, encouraging churches, working with committees, teaching evangelism. And it hit me one day in my quiet time. There's very few churches in this state that all the good Baptists are moving to the area. Most places in this state, all the good Baptists are moving out, and they're left to reach the folks that are there. They're radical unbelievers, unchurched folks. And I remember in my quiet time with tears in my eyes saying, thank you, God, for preparing me to work with the wonderful churches and pastors and staff of this state. So I think here in Whitehall you do have some good Baptists moving in, but I'll tell you what you have. You have a lot of folks that you think are more tough cases. So we want to talk about principles of working with the tough cases, and we want to talk a little more specifically about you and your role and where you fit in. Because I'm telling you, when you have a heart of love for Jesus, you have compassion for lost folks. It is there. You have to think about it. You have to have a burden for them. And I'm just telling you, I don't care how many times you come to church. I don't care how religious you act. If you don't care about lost folks, then there is something radically missing in your spiritual walk with Jesus. Because a love for him and a walk with him overflows in a concern about those that are not saved and not in the kingdom because you know that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please turn. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Tonight we're going to talk about evangelism as a process. We think about evangelism as an event, as a most part for Baptists, a one-time time we share our faith or we share our faith story or we have a crusade or an outreach event and we're pretty good at that as baptists but i want to tell you when it comes to folks that are not in the kingdom sometimes we have to we're only effective as it becomes a process and so that's what we're going to look at today tonight is first corinthians chapter three and we're going to look at the process first corinthians three would you stand with me as we read god's word Verse 1, brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? That means mere lost men. For, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, 
but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. Father, thank you for a wonderful night of worship. Thank you for touching our hearts through your spirit. These folks are so special. They've given up so much time. So speak, speak, Jesus. Speak to our heart. We ask in your name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you know much about 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Corinthians is correctory in nature. The first nine verses of chapter 1 are some of the most wonderful verses about our standing, our position in Christ. And then he launches into correcting problems for the whole rest of the book. If you're going to understand Corinthians and all that goes along where he talks about the tongues and he talks about uh, misunderstandings about the resurrection and, and the Lord's Supper, you have to understand he is correcting specific problems at the church. Here he's dealing with divisions in the church. One group said, I follow Paul. Another group says, whoa, I follow Apollos. He talks about a group later that says, oh, I follow Jesus. Boy, that's spiritual, isn't it? And he says, all you're doing is trying to find ways to not get along and to divide. So he says, don't follow personalities. He said in verse 5, after all, what is Paul and Apollos? Only servants. That word was also used in modern-day usage in those days of several things, including a waiter. If you go out tonight after service, you get the best steak you've ever had. Or if you're a vegetarian, you get a vegetation, a vegetarian, you get the best salad you've ever had. And you call the waiter over and say, sir, I just want to tell you, this is the best steak or the best salad I've ever had. It's so good. In fact, we're just going to build a statue of you in the town square. He would say two things. Number one, I'd rather have the tip than a statue. Second thing he would say is, actually, I just brought you the food. I didn't prepare the food. There's a cook in the kitchen that prepared the food. If you're going to follow somebody, follow the cook in the kitchen, not the guy that brought you the food. So he says, we're just servants. You don't follow servants. He said, we had roles with you. But he said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. He says, church of Corinth, salvation is a work of God, not a work of man. You don't follow man in salvation. You follow God because he's the one that saves. So he's trying to line out here that you don't divide over personalities. Also, he mentions evangelism and his work and Apollos' work of evangelism, and he likens it to an agricultural uh, setting. He talks about planting and watering and harvesting. Now, I don't know if you folks know much about <clears throat> gardening or, or agriculture. I bet you do. Do you have any gardeners here? Anybody here have a garden? Some of you do. I don't have one now. When I was a kid, my parents had one. And I remember when I was about nine years old thinking, I hate this garden. It is so big. I don't know how big 500 acres are, but I bet this garden is 500 acres. And I hated working in it. But I loved, uh, loved eating the produce out of it, that's for sure. So I know that there's a process when it comes to raising a crop. You know what happens if you're going to raise a crop. The first thing you do is plant the seed, and the next day you have a harvest, right? The way it works, right? <laughs> I want to get with you. You know how to grow stuff. <laughs> Doesn't happen that way, does it? So why in the world do I get these calls? Brother Sonny, I'm sick and tired of this new youth pastor we got. I mean, oh, yeah, last night they had a hayride. whoop de doo 75 kids came. And then Sunday morning comes, not a one of them came to church. It was a failure, right? Wrong. You don't plant the seed Saturday night and have a harvest Sunday morning unless the seed's already been worked. That makes sense? First, that's a process. You've got to understand you have to affirm process when it comes to evangelism. Now, I tell you what I love. I love when, when it happens quick. There's times I've walked up and met folks and just struck up. I was coming back from preaching one night in the El Dorado. It's late at night. I stopped by an easy mark. Uh, college kid there, red hair, green hair, pink hair, earrings on his face. <clears throat> and about 11 o'clock, he said, dude, he said, oh, you're all dressed up. What are you doing so dressed up late at night? And this is the way I like to do it. I just, you just tap on the door. You don't have to cram Jesus down people's throat. I'm just looking for folks the Holy Spirit's working on. So I just, I tapped on the door. I said, I've been out telling folks how to go to heaven. He said, man, you got time to tell me? He said, because I've been thinking about that. I ain't got no idea. Got saved. 
Not long after that, I was coming back. I actually stopped in Magnolia. I preached somewhere south of there. Stopped at another convenience store. It was about the same time. An African-American college student was there checking me out. He said, dude, y'all dressed up? What are you dressed up for? I thought, you know, this bait works. I'm going to try this again. I've been out telling folks how to go to heaven. He said, man, you got time to tell me? He said, let me check these folks out. Sometimes it happens that way. I love it when it does. But I want to tell you about most of my ministry. It didn't happen that way. It was slow. I remember thinking, I don't know if it's ever going to happen. And Lord, I have got right in the middle of these radical unbelievers. Mix my life with them. And it's messy. I don't know if it's ever going to happen. It's a process. See, here's what I saw in my ministry. There would be times we'd have a lot of stuff happen. Boy, I love it when things are happening. Folks are being saved. Folks are joining the church. Folks are recommitting. And you're just so thankful. Those times when nothing has happened, it kills you if you're a pastor. Those nothing times, three or four months of stuff happening, three or four or five months of nothing, three or four or five months of stuff happening, three or four or five, six months of nothing, the nothing kills me. I would get alone with God and say, Lord, am I not praying enough? Am I not preaching good enough sermons? Lord, I'm preaching the best sermons I have. Lord, I'm preaching the best sermons Adrian Rogers has. I don't understand this. <laughs> I read a book on preaching one time in college by Clyde Fant. He said, when in danger or in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. I would try that. <laughs> i tell you what I saw one time. We had a fall that was unbelievably uniquely blessed by God. And I started looking at these folks that were making decisions. And I could trace processes with all these folks. Processes of time, phases and stages they went through. And I could, I could document numerous, multiple contacts. Some would go back three months, some six months, some 12 months, some 18 months, some two years, some five, some ten. Occasionally, you'd hear about a 20-year. And one day in my quiet time, Pastor Paul, I read this verse, and it hit me. I was so convicted because I spent most of my ministry wearing people out because I have lots of energy. And we had 52 weeks of disconnected, disjointed, unconnected stuff going on. And I realized I have not built process into the calendar. Where one thing builds on another. And I realized that I've let folks fall through the cracks. And I committed right then to try to be very, very wise in the calendar and with every aspect of ministry. So, <clears throat> show you what this thing looks like. If you're, if you're a seed, the first thing you do if you're going to plant the seed is you plant the seed, right? You break the ground. The ground doesn't take the seed until the ground is broken up. See, some of you are working with hard ground, and the seed won't plant because you've not broken the ground. This is where Baptists aren't very good. This is where God put me 13 years with hard ground, bad sinners, folks who had no connection or thoughts or concern about church they wouldn't come to church they wouldn't let their kids come to you stuff they wouldn't let their children come to vbs they didn't have any concern or thoughts about ever connecting to church first two deacons that we made deacons my first church were two men that they said be careful brother sonny if you go see them they don't like preachers two of the greatest men i've ever met in my life I want to tell you, we've got to learn to break the ground. Now, let me tell you about break the ground. There's no one-time standard thing you do to break the ground. Sometimes you go with a break and plow this way, and then you go with a break and plow this way. Then you go with a disc this way, and then a disc this way, and this this way. Here's the key. You break the ground until the ground is broken. And then when the ground is broken, the next step is you plant the seed. And after the seed is planted, then there's watering and there's cultivating and there's fertilizer and maybe a second round of watering and cultivating and fertilizing. And as you get close to the harvest, you prepare some place to conserve the results. It can be a shed, a barn, your mother-in-law's back porch. You find some place to conserve the results or you'll lose the harvest. As I said this morning in church, that's small groups. And then you have the harvest, and then you have the follow-up plan to conserve the results. 
See, I could trace these folks that were making decisions. I started seeing the steps, multiple steps over time. And I could see, Lord, that's what we should have been doing all along. It's the process, affirming the process. Now, I want you to be thinking about, I'm going to talk about the process, and I'm going to talk about the steps, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about breaking hard ground, but I want you to keep this in mind because this is where we're headed tonight. Look in verse 7. Neither he who plants or he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Verse 8. The man or the person who plants and the man or person who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. Every one of you in this process has a step. Some of you are seed planters. Some of you are ground breakers. Some of you are great with water. Some of you are great with cultivation. Some of you, this sounds bad, but some of you are great with fertilizer. Everybody has a part, okay? Now, here's what I want to challenge you. You think tonight about your part because everybody has a role in this part of outreach. So that's what I want you to be thinking tonight. So let's look over here at uh, some examples. <clears throat> we had a guy one time that owned an electric company. His sister went to her church. Uh, she had him on the prayer list, and she just told me a couple of times, just I want you to pray for my brother. So I went to see him. I did what I did everywhere a pastor. I went to his house, knocked on the door. I saw him at his business. He came to the door. I said, hey, my name is Sonny Tucker, and I'm the pastor. I don't know you, Brother Sonny. I said, well, I just want to tell you. I don't know if you have a church. He said, he's trying to shut down. I said, I just want to tell you, if you don't have a church, we'd like to be your church. If you don't have a pastor, I'd like to be your pastor. But you never have to come to church for us to be your church. You never have to give a dime for me to be your pastor. <laughs> really? <laughs> he said, I've never got that from a Baptist preacher. He said, so what I have to do? I said, just agree that you'll call me if you have a need. And I said, I'd just like to have two things to pray for about. So I got my pen. What's two things I can pray for about? Well, he gave me two things. I prayed for him. I pulled a little book out of my pocket. I said, if you have time, I'd really like to talk to you about how you know for certain you'll go to heaven when he dies. I said, that's okay. Take the book. My office number's on the back. You just read it. You tell me when you want to talk about it. Now, he didn't understand. I got two prayer requests from him. Now, I'm his pastor now. I'm going to be back in a couple weeks, see how the prayer requests go. <laughs> I'm not going to push him. I'm not going to guilt trick it, drip him. So we had a great first contact. I still can't share the gospel with him. He's never going to come right now, okay? We have a town festival, which is kind of embarrassing. It was like a drunk fest. It was terrible. Well, I saw him at the drunk fest, and I went to the town festival, and he's standing on the street corner with about seven of his guys drinking long neck. I don't know what comes in long necks, Budweiser's or something. And I see them, and I walk over there, and they're like, whoo, the preacher's coming. <laughs> they don't know what to do. Well, there's no, they're just like, ah, oh, we're caught. I just walked up and chatted with them, and I uh, met the guy. We laughed for a second, asked how they were doing. They all liked to fish. We talked about catching fish, and I walked off and said, y'all have a great day. They couldn't believe I was nice to them sitting on the street corner drinking long neck buds or whatever. See, I don't expect lost people to act like anything other than lost folks. We say, Brother Sonny, did you say something to them about their beer? No, not a word. That's not the issue. The issue is not alcohol. The issue is Jesus. You don't go to hell because you disagree with my view of alcohol. You go to hell for eternity because you do not trust Jesus as your Savior. We're real bad about getting a cart in front of the horse. Clarence Shell, the state of Atlas director before me, said this in 1981, changed my view of, of working with lost folks. Here's what he said. He's preaching. He's a great preacher, still good. He said, Arkansas Baptist, he said, we know we're supposed to be fishers of men. But the problem with Arkansas Baptist is we go around trying to clean the fish before we ever even catch the fish. And he's talking about a dagger in my heart. Because I preached a whole lot of sermons trying to clean fish that weren't even caught yet. So I just quit. I want to catch them first. And I'll let the Holy Spirit, the Bible, do the cleaning. So we had a good first visit. He's on the forklift one day, wiring a shop. New employee on the forklift. He's on a pallet on the fork, 25 feet up. New employee says he knew how to run the forklift. Wrong lever. He goes down 25 feet, breaks his back. 
take him to the hospital. <clears throat> I go to see him. Two of the deacons go to see him. Two more of the deacons go to see him. Sunday school class mows his yard. Somebody gets a key and cleans his house. Deacons go clean shop. Seen an old lady sending prayer cards. Another group goes to see him. He's getting steady letters. I go see him in the hospital one day. You're not going to believe what he did. Dear Lord Jesus, come in my heart and save me. Then some other folks followed up with him, get him in a small group and a disciple him. Do you see the process? It's a process there. Had a guy one time, <clears throat> they told me, he said, be careful, Brother Sonny. This guy hates preachers. <laughs> I think he did. So <laughs> I, I went to see him twice. I slowed down in front of his house. He's an elderly gentleman, 85 years old, rocking on the front porch. And I'd pull up, I'd see him rocking, I'd chicken out and drive on. <laughs> Finally, one day, I said, this is ridiculous. So I pulled in the driveway, got out, he said, who are you? I said, my name's Sonny Tucker on the past. I know who you are. What are you doing here? I said, can I just be honest with you? That's the way I like it. Just be straight. I said, that's the way I like it, too. <laughs> By the way, I love tough, crusty old men. I have led a ton of them to Jesus. He said, uh, I said, I heard you're the meanest man in this county. He said, I am the meanest man in this county. I mean, I have been known to fight. You'll do where to steer clear of me. I said, you're an old man. I think I can outrun you. <laughs> he thought that was funny. He said, come on up. First thing he wants to I want to know why you Baptists think this is wrong. It ain't something. I want to know why you Baptists think this is wrong. I want to know why you Baptists think it's wrong for me to dance. And I said, dance, you're 85 years old. You can't even walk. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to talk to you about this. I said, don't you have an opinion? I said, I got an opinion about everything. But that's not the issue. Well, what's the issue? I said, what you do with Jesus? He said, I don't want to talk about that. I said, fine. But until you get ready to talk about that, that's all we're going to talk about. So we chatted about the weather. I said, by the way, told him about being a church member or me being his pastor, and he agreed, gave me two things to pray for, sister in Cincinnati and grandson in Dallas or something like that. So I prayed. <clears throat> Came back two weeks later, he's raking straw, pine straw. <laughs> he's too old to rake pine straw. I rake pine straw with him. Some young folks came by and just said hi and helped him clean out some on something on the back porch. They just chatted, laughed, and have fun. He didn't know anybody cared about him. He is tough and crusty. Some of senior adults invited him to the senior adult stuff we did. A lot of fun, a lot of great stuff. He didn't come, but he got invited because he mattered. I stopped by two weeks later. He's picking tomatoes. I helped him pick tomatoes. <clears throat> I stopped by two weeks later. He's shelling. Purple hole peas. I hate shelling purple hole peas. <laughs> but I shelled long as I could do it. And little as I had to do it to be spiritual, but I did shell purple <laughs> hole peas. Some other folks came by. <clears throat> One day I came by and he had the Bible sitting beside his table. I said, what are you doing with that Bible? You don't even believe it. He said, you might be surprised. Next time we came by, he asked me about some verses. I shared the plan of salvation. Some of the old men went by to see him, just check on him, pray with him. Some of the kids went by to check on him again. I went by one day, you're not going to believe what he did. Dear Lord Jesus, come in my heart and save me. And within three or four months, he was lying in state at our church in front of the podium and I preached his funeral. Do you see the process? Do you see the steps? Do you see how many folks are involved? Folks, it's a process. It's a matter of steps. Had a whole bunch of community kids, <clears throat> unruly, running wild. Parents didn't care much about them. We had a whole bunch of good kids in the church. <clears throat> we did special stuff for them. I brought some adults in, trained them how to work with these folks, especially men. Ladies, got to have ladies, especially men. Some of these boys that, and, and even girls who do not have dads, especially men, uh, they, they didn't do anything special. The guys told me, I'm not huggy, touchy, feely. I don't want to stand up and talk a lot and cry. And, you know, I do all that. Your wife can do that. We don't want you to do that. I want you to be there. I want you to care. They play ball with them. 
They take them fishing. They do this kind of stuff. Multiple steps. Real men that cared. Real ladies that were like sisters. And it didn't take long. They start getting saved by the tons. It is unbelievable what happens. But it's multiple steps. Folks, it is a process. I want you to understand that there's a process involved. Let me give you a couple suggestions, especially over here. On these hard cases where the ground is hard and the ground's not broken up, for these folks over here, you have to pray. Hard, focused, laborious, intense praying with fasting. You have to call their name out that God will convict them and save them. I'm telling you, you do not break the ground unless you pray and you pray hard. You have set a pattern in this church of 30 days of prayer. Do not let it go. You keep that pattern going. You keep shifting. I'm telling you, somehow when you pray for folks, the Holy Spirit is like a sledgehammer that starts breaking hard-hearted hearts. Revival up in Franklin, my buddy Don Self, that's my turkey hunt buddy, had an exchange student from uh, either East or West Germany. And he told me, he said, this is my exchange student. He said he's an atheist. He told me he's an atheist. But he goes to church because he has to. And uh, their church did 40 days of prayer. And the pastor called said, it would be okay if I just made it 60 days of prayer? I said, no. He said, really? I said, I'm kidding. I said, I think that's great. So fertile. Hearts were so right. I get up and preach the same sermon I preached two weeks before. Everybody fell asleep. Just a, a week before the revival, this exchange student said, Okay, Don, I admit maybe there's a God. I don't know which God, whose God, maybe there's a God. As soon as we begin the invitation, the first sermon, here he comes down and tells the pastor, I believe Jesus is indeed the Son of God and the only way to be saved. And I publicly here receive him as Savior and profess my faith in him. I want to be publicly baptized so the world knows I'm a Christ follower. It just broke loose. Folks, you've got to pray. Second thing about folks over here is multiple touches. And it's never a one-time shot. You never, sometimes you invite them one time when they come, but that's rare. It's rare they come to one event. Sometimes they do. And normally it's multiple touches of fellowship, of ministry, of different events, of children, of things. It's multiple, multiple touches. I may have told you this a few years ago, but I've got to tell you again. I started Sunday school class one time with young adults, and I invited, had 40 prospects. I uh, invited all four to a party at my house. Uh, 29 or 31 showed up. We didn't do much spiritual except just play ball. I prayed. They just had never been to a church and had a good experience. After it was over, a guy came up. He said, Brother Sonny, can I talk to you? I said, yes, sir. He said, boy, we had fun here tonight, didn't we? I said, we really did. He said, I didn't think Baptists believe in having fun. I said, some of them don't. He said, I know, I know some of them. He said, but you do? I said, yep. He said, that's pretty cool. I asked another question. He said, uh, am I here to believe we had a party and we had this much fun and nobody was under the influence of alcohol? I said, well, I can't say for sure about the two deacons that were here, but it wasn't anybody else. <laughs> and he laughed because the two deacons were his close friend and two of the greatest men ever to walk on the face there. And who knew better? He said, that's pretty cool. I ain't never been to no party that folks wasn't drinking and having fun. Let me ask you another question. He said, uh, there wasn't anybody here that made a pass at my old lady at this party. I started to say, she is not that good looking. But I didn't say that. I thought I better not do that. He said, another question I have, he said, does folks here know me and my old ladies living together we ain't even married? I said, that's none of our business. He said, real serious, you're right. That ain't none of y'all's business. Do your folks know? I said, absolutely. He said, that ain't saying anything to me about it. I said, no. I said, we love you just like you are, and he does too. And when you get saved, he's got plans for you. He knew what that meant. He said, I don't tell you, men, my old lady's been thinking about God. We're going to come to church one of these days. He didn't come to church for months, but he came one Sunday and played softball. Some of the, the two deacons went by to see him and were his buddies. He went on a men and boys fishing trip. He went on a men and boys squirrel hunt trip. He came to some party at somebody's house, Sunday school party. He came one Sunday night after church. You see the multiple touches. I went by one day. You're not going to believe what he did. 
him and his wife both held hands and did this. Lord Jesus, we ask you to save us right now. Then he said, Brother Sonny, can we get married next Friday? I said, no. He said, we can't. I said, yeah, I'm kidding. You can get married. We had a private ceremony. Multiple touches is the key for folks like this. And this is one of the ways you folks fit in. Okay? Multiple touches. Listen to me quick. Friendship is big for these people. You have to affirm, accept, and befriend. Number four, you have to move at their speed. You cannot push, you cannot hack, you cannot guilt trip. Some of you, you get around your grandkids, and that's the worst experience of their life. But you know those saying, you catch more flies with vinegar than honey, right? Don't let it be a bad experience every time you get around these folks. Quit hacking on them. You don't like folks hacking on you? Don't push them. You don't like folks pushing on you? Move at their pace. They'll let you know what the pace is. Don't do nothing, but just pray for discernment that you know their space. Focus on Jesus, not side issues, because that's the one issue. And I don't even know how to say this and sound spiritual. But don't let the devil's crowd outfun you. Y'all know what I mean? Don't let the devil's crowd outfun you. Fellowship from folks who really love you and really care about you is one of the greatest things in life. And they have parties and they have fun, but it's not with folks that really care about them. It's not with folks that care about their best interests. And when they get around you in fellowship like out here and y'all laugh and carry on, they don't get that kind of real fellowship. And I have, I have seen more folks touch and connected in a fishing boat, on a softball field, at a ladies' shindig than almost any place in the world. Don't let the devil's crowd out fun you connect. And as you get over here, you need to know how to share your faith. You need to know how to tell your faith story. You need to have intentionally evangelistic events where they have a chance to hear the gospel. And we'll cover that. You probably already have that pretty good. Now, let's, let's wrap it up. Let me show you two things you need to see. Again, verse 8, the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. He says you have different roles. Some of you folks... You are groundbreakers, either by your personality, or you know how to have parties, or you know how to pray, or you know how to hug. You break the ground, and you keep doing it. One of the deacons I had one time, Big Sam, when I was at that church, Big Sam was 6'6", 260, no fat. Big, deep boy. Big Sam walks in the room. He does this. Ha, 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 hey, hey, you did, hey. And you just start laughing. You're afraid not to laugh. And he just <laughs> loosens everything up. Ever, we reach tons of kids. Big Sam's the reason we reach kids. They, hey, y'all going to make you feel welcome. They ran over there. You're afraid to say no. Broke the ground. We did more stuff with, with teenage boys and students. He was always there. He, I never saw him lead one person to Jesus, but he broke the ground. Some of you are groundbreakers. Some of you, we could not let you break the ground. If we put you on a tractor with a disc, you would run into every vehicle in Jefferson County. Stay off the tractor. But I'll tell you what some of you are. You're seed planters. You tell your faith story. You hand out tracts. You share the gospel. Somehow you get the gospel to them. Some of you are the folks with the water. You're the folks with the fertilizer. You're the folks with the cultivator or the second round or the third round. And maybe you're the harvester, and maybe you can serve the results. Every one of you, maybe maybe you're strong in one area. Do it. Whatever you're good at, do it. Some of you, you do different things with different folks. You play different roles. Just find your role. I tell you, one of the churches I pastored reached a lot of folks. It wasn't because of me. It's because of folks in the pew. They found their part, and they did their part. Here's the last thing. You've got to see it. You've got to see this. The one who plants, the one who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. Let me tell you a mistake we make in Baptist life. We hail and praise those who harvest, who lead folks to Jesus, to the neglect of those who don't lead folks to Jesus. That's the negative thing. I'm for folks sharing their faith. But I'll tell you, I preached a revival a year, a little over a year ago at First Baptist Church, Mary and Clay Hallmark and the great staff, Chris Roller, 
or Chris, the youth pastor, and about 45 people saved. You say, boy, man, I bet that they say, that preacher, are you kidding? It wasn't me. I was just driving the combine. Other folks had worked it all up. I showed up when there was a harvest ready, and I was smart enough to preach sermons that are easy to understand with a clear gospel message and give a very plain to the point gospel invitation. And folks responded. Anybody here could have done it. See, we put way too I think we ought to try to lead folks to Jesus. But some of you have been working so hard and never leading anybody to Jesus, and you think it doesn't count. You think you're worthless, and you are so wrong. I preached a revival one time in the North Little Rock area. Great, great Baptist leader there. His grandson got saved. Woo, it was great. So let me tell you what I think it's going to look like that applies to you. <clears throat> I think I'll stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't think I, my personal opinion, Pastor Paul can, can fix my theological messes after I leave. I don't think I'll be judged for my sin. I think Jesus was judged for my sin on the cross. I think I'll be judged for my life and what I do. So I think... I'll have to give an account. Jesus say, hey, that revival, you did great. You prayed. Confess your sin. It's what I, this kid was saved. And I think he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. And there'll be some short elder lady beside me that in relation to this young man being saved, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Same commendation I get. And knowing me, I'll say, Jesus, she wasn't even there. <laughs> When he got saved, she was already dead. Why did you give her the same commendation as me? No, that's his first grade Sunday school teacher that shared the gospel first time he understood. And then some real tall, lanky guy, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Same commendation as me. But Jesus, he wasn't in there when the kid got saved. Why did he get the same commendation as me? Because the night that the kid really got under conviction to be saved, they had a hayride, and it was at his farm. And he put on the hayride, and this person right here gets the same accommodation, brought the hot dogs. And this person right here is the one that hugged his neck every Sunday at the door. And here's a senior adult lay the hug his neck every Sunday walking out the door. And here's the person that smiled at him. And here's the student at school that shared their faith story. And here's the teacher that made him feel like a million dollars that let him know that, that she was a believer. And here's the person who turned on the air at the church. And here's the person who prayed... And here's the folks who paid his way to church camp. And a whole string of people get the exact same commendation as me. So here's what I want you to understand. This idea of folks being, becoming believers, especially hard cases, it's a process of multiple touches and multiple folks. And don't you ever say, because I'm not the one that leads them to Jesus, my work doesn't count. It's not true. I tell you what I want. When it comes to evangelism, I want the nicest, friendliest folks at the front door. I want the sweetest senior adult ladies hugging on the students. I want the guys who know how to have fun and live for Jesus, and they're real men, really committed to Jesus. They're just friends with them. And I want the folks at the church that know how to pray. And I want the folks who work with the choirs and organizations to really mean it and really be serious. You give me folks like that, and I'm telling you, it's a ripe, fertile climate for folks to be saved. And that's why God is blessing this church, because of folks like you. And even though you try, you've never led anybody to Jesus yet, but you don't understand. One day you're going to stand before him. He's going to say, those hugs, those texts, you share your faith story, you sponsor their way to camp, you've given them a call, you've invited them over and over and over, you praying for them, was such a vital part of them being saved. One story, and I'm going to close. <clears throat> I heard a testimony of a guy in seminary, one of the most touching I heard. He said, I was a young man mid-30s, high to my business, top of the world, top of my game in the corporate world. I got sloppy. I started taking shortcuts. <clears throat> I lost my family. I lost my wife. I lost my kids. I lost my business. I knew better. Pride ruined my life. 
I decided to take my life. He said, I decided mid-afternoon, Sunday afternoon, I was going to take my life. <clears throat> I, said, I had the means set up. But he said, I'm going to go to church at Bellevue and hear Adrian Rogers preach because I see him on TV. I'm going to see if he can say one thing that taught me out of taking my life. I went to church. He said, I don't know what he preached on. I didn't hear anything that touched me. I know it was a good sermon. He said, because he's my pastor now. He said, I, didn't, I know it was great worship, but I didn't hear anything in the worship that touched me. I know folks said hello, but I didn't see anybody. I walked dejected to my car to get in and go home and take my life. But he said, as I was going in my car, I opened the door to step in. Two cars over, there was a dear, sweet, senior adult lady looking at me, and I saw the corner of my eye her looking at me. And I looked, and he said, I, I don't, can't explain this. He said, I'm not a mystic. But he said, she looked at me with a stare as hard as I've ever seen. It's like tentacles came out of her eye, bam, and stuck in me. And I just stared at her like, what, what? She stared at me like this. I could feel her eyes for a turn. I just looked, and she stared at me. I'm just staring at her. And all of a sudden, she did this. He said, I melted. He said, it's so weird, but he said, what I never heard from the sermon that day and what I never got from the worship that day, a dear sweet senior adult lady that got my attention said it all in a smile. That she stopped me and smiled at me. That's my message from God that I count. He said, I didn't take my life. I got right. I got my wife back. I got my family back. I'm a great member of Bellevue Baptist Church. He said, if anybody knows who that lady is, would you please tell her to come see me? I want to hug her neck. She will never know. She changed my life. The gospel came through her. My kids have a dad. My wife has a husband because of her. Let me tell you about you. Maybe you don't do the big stuff. Quit writing yourself off. Start where you know in any part of this process, and you step to the plate and do what you know to do and what you can't see until you get to heaven. You become a part of the great process. Would you stand to your feet and bow your head?